Welcome to Austin Peace Inside the System. I'm Jasmine Logan, and I'm joined by Emeritus Political Science Professor, Dr. David Canervo. On Inside the System, Dr. Canervo and I will be discussing some of the controversial current events in the world of politics. Today, we'll be covering the recent media coverage surrounding President Biden's age, followed by Trump's appeal to be on the 2024 ballot, as well as updates on some pressing foreign affairs. So stay tuned. Thanks for sticking around. The first topic we'll be discussing today has already been a concern for voters in the past and has recently gotten a lot of attention in the media. Following special counsel Robert Hur's investigation into President Joe Biden, it was decided that no criminal charges were necessary. However, Hur's reasoning for this decision has once again called President Biden's age and memory into question. Let's take a look at some of the assessments Hur made in his report. The special counsel's reports. report did not recommend charging President Joe Biden with a crime, but it did paint a picture of a forgetful commander in chief who failed to properly protect classified documents. Special counsel Robert Hur laid out in detail how President Joe Biden mishandled classified materials, writing that FBI agents discovered documents in Mr. Biden's Wilmington, Delaware home. Hur's report noted the president's cooperation with the investigation and concluded the evidence did not support prosecuting Biden. When explaining why he didn't bring charges, the special counsel also wrote about Biden's age and memory creating concern on Capitol Hill and beyond. I mean, people from all over the world are going to read that. And it was basically one of the defenses was he's a nice man who's elderly and can't remember. The report states Biden had frequent memory lapses during his interviews with investigators, including not being able to recall exactly when he served as vice president. I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. Biden, who is 81, immediately pushed back against those details in the report. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. But during that same press conference, Biden misspoke, referring to the president of Egypt as the president of Mexico, a moment that undercut his forceful pushback against the special counsel's observations. Now, several Democrats who have worked closely with Biden, including Vice President Kamala Harris, have slammed some of the claims about memory loss in that report. But polling even before this report came out showed that age is the issue that most worries voters who support Biden's policies. Reporting at the White House, Julia Benbrook. Ian Sams, the spokesman for the White House Counsel's Office, has responded to her statements about Biden's memory, saying they were intentionally misleading. Regardless of the validity of this assessment, President Biden's age has been a concern for voters since before he won the 2020 election. Trump and Biden are approximately three and a half years apart. And although I hear many concern about Biden's age, I haven't really heard the same for Trump. Why do you think that is, Dr. Canervo? Well, that, that's an interesting phenomenon that has occurred mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the closeness in their ages. Uh, I think to a great degree it's resulted as because of the uh, uh, physical appearance of the two men mm -hmm. uh, in front of the camera. If you look at Biden, he appears to be someone who is uh, very slow, very deliberate in his uh, walking, his, uh, his gait. His steps are, are such that uh, they are very short. It's almost like he is shuffling as he walks. He's very stiff, and his face has a little bit of a blank to it. And while I think he's thinking and he, he knows what he's doing, nevertheless, the, the optics of it are such that uh, he looks old. He looks older than uh, Trump by really a fair amount. 
Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of, uh, uh, unfortunately, whether uh, Biden needs uh, to have uh, hip surgery or, or, or something else to, mm -hmm. to uh, make him a little more limber. Nevertheless, uh, it, it certainly gives the appearance that uh, he is older. Trump, on the other hand, uh, certainly uh, is a little bit more flowing in the way that he uh, does walk and move, mm -hmm. uh, which gives the appearance of him being really much younger. Uh, if you look at their rhetoric, however, what you see is that uh, uh, Trump actually has a, a lot of sentences that don't fit well together. He, it's almost like a stream of consciousness on his part in the way he talks, whereas uh, Biden, uh, while it is written out for him, needless to say, is, is more coherent um, in what he says. Uh, so those, those are the things that strike me about the difference between these two individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it does hurt Biden, I think, in, his, in the perception the public has of him. Yeah, so it, it has a lot more to do with appearance than it does the actual age of our current president. Well, I think so. Uh, certainly, there have been times when uh, Trump, in one of his many trials, has uh, said he doesn't recall something, mm -hmm. doesn't remember, uh, and, and certainly um, special counsel or her assessment of uh, Biden was mm -hmm. a result of, I think, uh, Biden not always remembering some of the facts either. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't think the two are, are very different in that regard. I understand what you mean. Um, a lot of Biden's allies and even his opposition have been pushing for this interview to be made public. How do you think that could affect the public's perception of the situation? That they've been uh, pushing for? The interview about um, his memory and his age being an issue. Well, um, one of the things about uh, doing that, I, I know uh, that Nikki Haley has suggested some sort of test for older folks mm -hmm. to see whether they are on top of things. Um, yes. Others. Uh, are, in, in President Biden's own party are concerned, as you said, mm -hmm. about his age and about his memory. And, and those things are all true. The other side of it is, uh, of course, the Democratic Party has not uh, come up with a, a, a better alternative candidate than uh, Biden. Uh, the one that would be most likely, of course, would be uh, the Vice President. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, Harris has not wanted to uh, deviate from the program, so to speak, that uh, 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 Biden and his supporters have, and so he does, she doesn't want to challenge the, uh, the president outright. And I can understand that. You don't want to, if you're vice president, go out and attack your boss, the president, um, and get kicked off the ticket, which is what might very well happen. Definitely. So uh, without any alternatives, uh, popular alternatives uh, on the part of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. they are left with uh, an aging Biden. That's a fair point. Um, with Robert Hur's report, I know there is a precedent for, you know, these kind of things to remain concealed with executive privilege, but there's also a precedent to be released if it is in their favor. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see what's gonna happen with this situation. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some have also made the argument that we shouldn't have elected officials past the age of retirement, which is approximately 67 years old. Do you think there's an argument to be made here? Well, one of the problems with, with uh, supporting that idea mm -hmm. is that of course the Constitution sets the uh, uh, requirements for mm -hmm. uh, the presidency. And one of the requirements, of course, is a minimum age, but not a maximum age. Exactly. And uh, then other requirements as well. Natural born citizen must have lived in the country for mm -hmm. 14 years and so on. But uh, nothing about maximum age. And I think the framers of the Constitution thought that it was up to the uh, voters to decide uh, when someone was competent and when they were not. Uh, 
Supreme Court justices have gone into the, their 80s and have served mm -hmm. very well uh, at that point mm -hmm. in their lives. So uh, presidents can as well. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic point. And we'll definitely talk more about the requirements uh, within the Constitution for a presidential candidate when we discuss Trump's appeal next after this short break. After you joined our family, it was like, I really do feel complete now. You're not gonna get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at nhtsa.gov slash the right seat. so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. Another issue that's been in the headlines for a while is Trump's trial. His eligibility to be on the ballot for the 2024 election is under question. The Colorado Supreme Court ruled that he is not eligible due to his violation of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. However, Trump and his legal team are taking this to the U.S. Supreme Court, so they will have the final say. Let's hear some commentary from Trump's lawyers and Supreme Court on this issue. Julia Bembrook reports. A lawyer representing the Colorado voters who challenged Donald Trump's eligibility in the state argues that a post-Civil War insurrection ban in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment bars Trump from serving as president again. What is very clear from the history is, is that the framers were concerned about charismatic rebels who might rise through the ranks up to and including the presidency of the United States. But a lawyer for the former president says that the 14th Amendment does not apply to Trump's presidency. Officer of the United States refers only to appointed officials, and it does not encompass elected individuals such as the president or members of Congress. Trump's team also arguing that what took place on January 6th was a riot, not an insurrection. And the events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things, but it did not qualify as insurrection as that term is used in Section 3. The justices seemed poised to rule in favor of keeping the former president on the ballot, several of them signaling concern over the far-reaching implications if they rule in Colorado's favor. Why should a single state have the ability to make this determination, not only for their own citizens, but for the rest of the nation. Reporting in Washington, I'm Julia Benbrook. Part of Trump's defense is that Section 3 doesn't apply to the presidential office. Do you think there is any validity to this statement on a constitutional level? Well, I don't. Uh, if, if I were the Colorado uh, Attorney General mm -hmm. arguing that point, uh, I would argue that the other offices are listed because it, he wanted, or the writer of the uh, amendment wanted to make it clear that these lower offices were certainly to be uh, considered under that rule as well, mm -hmm. but that the presidential office was certainly understood being the most important office, that you, you certainly don't want someone who is a, a traitor, someone who... Uh, uh, disavows their loyalty to the Constitution to be uh, a president. Mm -hmm. Also, the uh, uh, Section 3 of the uh, amendment says that all officers, all officers mm -hmm. under the Constitution, and says uh, federal, state, and local. Mm -hmm. So if they're all included, then certainly why would the presidency not be included in that? So it seems to me that the, the uh, the writing of the particular section of the Constitution is uh, uh, clear enough and uh, 
tends to include enough offices at all three levels, that certainly the presidency would be included as well. I agree. Why would it apply to every other officer of the government, but not the president? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Another argument that his legal team is making is that it wasn't even an insurrection to begin with. What do you think about that? Well, uh, it's difficult to not call it an insurrection in my mind. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Constitution, uh, the president has no role in the activities that took place on January 6th. Mm -hmm. These were the activities, of course, to confirm the electoral votes from each state to certify them. The vice president has a role in that as president of the Senate. The senators and members of the House of Representatives has a, have a role as representatives of their states acting in concert to confirm those votes. Mm -hmm. uh, the president has no role, not anything that he's supposed to be doing. And instead, he is out on the uh, lawn outside the White House, mm -hmm. um, getting his uh, supporters all worked up and telling them to go to the Capitol and see to it that uh, the votes are not certified. So he's acting against what the Constitution says is mm -hmm. to be done. If that is not a uh, uh, insurrection, I don't know what is. So it seems to me that uh, he was active in the insurrection uh, in fomenting it, mm -hmm. but also uh, the Section 3 of Article Four of Amendment 14 says that uh, people who support an insurrection also, and while I think you can argue very well that, that President uh, Trump fomented the insurrection, he was clearly a supporter. He failed to do anything to clear the uh, uh, Capitol building during the insurrection. He failed to do uh, anything to, to limit it to protect the uh, members of the House and the Senate who were in the building. He did not call the police. And at the same time, uh, when things were wrapping up, he said himself that he loved these people. He thought they were great people mm -hmm. who stormed the Capitol. If that's not support, again, I don't know what is. I definitely agree. And I think that's an important distinction to make, even if he can't be charged with leading the insurrection he definitely was outright a supporter of it. I am nervous about um, the Supreme Court's ruling on this appeal and the kind of precedent this could lead for trials involving politicians in the future. Um, but now moving on to some pressing foreign affairs. Please stay tuned after this short break. Lolo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you as you bring our colorful stories to the world. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. Moving on to some foreign affairs issues. Obviously, there's a lot we could unpack with the ongoing war in Ukraine and between Israel and Hamas. But for today, I want to focus more so on the role the U.S. government is playing in these issues. The U.S. has sent billions of dollars in aid to both Ukraine and Israel in their respective wars. There's recently been some conflict within the Senate about sending more aid to Ukraine. Here, let's take a look at NATO's commentary on aid for Ukraine. Fresh commitments being made to Ukraine here in Brussels at the NATO meeting of defense secretaries, pledges of uh, a million extra drones, a training center that's be opened to be opened in Poland uh, to help train Ukrainian armed forces, uh, but perhaps more importantly, a commitment uh, to uh, continuing to press, not just for the further support of Ukraine, but for the foundational principles of NATO and the importance of its strength now more than ever. That's what we've heard a great deal of here in Brussels in the wake of the comments by the former American President Donald Trump over the weekend, going so far as to suggest that Moscow may be encouraged 
uh, to uh, come and test a NATO member. Those who didn't pay, he said, clearly rattled a number of European uh, officials have been speaking out these last few days. And here in Brussels, it was the turn of Jens Stoltenberg to address head on the question of whether the United States would remain an unwavering supporter of NATO or not. When you look at the opinion polls, there is record high support for NATO, both in North America, uh, United States, uh, Canada, and in uh, Europe. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, confident that uh, uh, NATO will remain the strongest and most successful alliance in history. Uh, and I uh, expect the United States to continue to be a staunch uh, ally. Jen Stoltenberg there uh, reassuring in a press conference at the end of the meetings what he says uh, will be the continued importance of NATO for all of its members. This was also the opportunity for a meeting of the Ukraine contact group. This is when NATO defense ministers speak directly to their Ukrainian counterpart who spoke to them from Kyiv by video conference, giving them an idea of uh, what's been happening on the ground in Ukraine and again urging his counterparts now more than ever to stand firm. Melissa Balsiena in Brussels. All right, let's take a look at Biden's commentary on aid for Ukraine as well. But it's about time they step up, don't you think? Instead of going on a two week vacation, two weeks, they're walking away. Two weeks. What are they thinking? My God, this is bizarre. Are you more confident now that you'll get the Ukraine aid given what's happened today? Well, I hope to God it helps. But I mean, the idea we need anything more to get the Ukraine aid. So there's been a lot going on um, in the Middle East, as well as between Russia and Ukraine. How do you think all of these foreign affairs issues could affect the upcoming election? Well, Jasmine, traditionally, the uh, foreign affairs have not been uh, a major impact on election outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, elections are primarily um, decided by uh, internal affairs, pr primarily the economy mm -hmm. and how people feel about their pocketbooks mm -hmm. rather than what's going on overseas. However, in this case, uh, what we find is in the case of, of Trump and the Republican Party more generally is that uh, there's a, a, a shift, a much different shift in support for Russia, particularly by the Republican Party and, and Trump. Trump, as uh, we heard in earlier uh, reports on TV, has said that uh, if uh, NATO nations did not pay up, he would mm -hmm. tell Russia to do whatever they wanted to do. And you would not have heard that 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Republicans used to be very strong uh, anti-communists, anti-Russians. And, and while Russia is not particularly a communist party right now, they certainly are operating like one mm -hmm. uh, under Putin with uh, very few freedoms available. So to uh, not support Ukraine, which is a uh, a Western supporting, United States supporting country is, uh, uh, I think, a serious uh, problem. Uh, it shows our other allies that uh, perhaps we are not someone to be counted on very well by them in future uh, agreements. And NATO has existed since World War II. It's one that we have over and over and over again uh, supported. And yet for uh, Trump to argue that, uh, well, we're not gonna come to a country's defense. We're gonna let Russia do whatever they wanna do. That is a, a serious matter, I think, which uh, I hope voters will think about. I agree, going uh, against- N Nikki Haley and others argue mm -hmm. that uh, Ukraine is important because we have to stop Russia from uh, it's aggression. Mm -hmm. If uh, Russia takes back Ukraine, will they go into Slovenia? Will they go into Lithuania? Exactly. That, Where will issue. it end? That's right. I agree. And going against one of the fundamentals of NATO, which is supporting your allies when they're under attack, could have quite a few repercussions. Um, you know, if our allies are worried that we're not going to come to their defense, who will end up coming to our defense as well? It has to work both ways. Right. 
And of course, the irony is that uh, on uh, uh, September 9-11 attack on us, mm -hmm. that was the first time that uh, Article 5 of the NATO pact had been implemented in which all the countries agreed to support us. And now uh, Trump is arguing that if he's elected, he'll turn his back on them. That could be an area of concern, hopefully, for voters. That hopefully it's something they will take into consideration. Well, that's all we have for you guys today. Be sure to tune in a couple weeks for a new episode.